Well, thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk to you today about some of the work that I've been doing over the last, oh, I guess, 10 years or so since I arrived in Australia from the UK after I can finish my PhD. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about some work that we've been doing um, for in, in acute low back pain. Um, and then we'll hopefully be able to answer the question of um, what have the guidelines done for that, uh, uh, done for us. Uh, the reason we're asking that question really is um, because much of the work that I've been doing has been directed towards trying to understand uh, a little bit clearer um, about what the guidelines suggest and whether or not there's evidence for those suggestions um, and whether there's anything that we can improve on guidelines. Okay, let's get started. Okay, just so that we all know that we're talking about the same thing, I know you all know this already, but talking about today about low back pain. And low back pain for me is, uh, for us, all the stuff I'm going to be talking about today is pain that lasts for longer than 24 hours. And for at least, um, uh, at least 24 hours and less than six weeks. Um, if there's a period before that, the onset of pain that of at least a month, pain free, then we call this a new episode of acute low back pain. Those are pretty standard terms. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Um, but just to make sure that we're talking about the same type of back pain. Uh, obviously also it's bounded by the um, gluteal fold, the bottom of the gluteal fold and the bottom of the 12th rib. Um, any pain that comes from that area can also go down the leg as well. Um, but we're really not talking about um, sciatica or pain that has neurological symptoms. We think about that as something a little bit different. Or indeed pain that um, is associated with a serious spinal pathology. We did some work a few years ago out in Western Sydney um, when we recruited a thousand patients who had just developed um, an acute episode of low back pain and went to see their primary care clinician. And we tried to investigate, um, try, tried to identify any serious spinal pathologies as a reason for their back pain consultation. And we found very few serious spinal pathologies. In fact, we couldn't find any cancer in um, 1,200 patients. Um, mostly we found fracture, we found 11 fractures. So, um, so we'd say that serious spinal pathology as a cause of a first consultation for low back pain, for acute low back pain, is pretty rare, um, counting for less than 1%. Neurological symptoms counts for about 5%, 4 to 5%. So this presentation will be about the other 95% of people who have non-specific low back pain. It's a pretty horrible term. Nevertheless, it's the one that we have for people who don't have, uh, there's no structural cause that we can identify reliably that's a cause of their symptoms. Okay, so what else about back pain? Well, of course, it's a major cause of work disability um, and work loss, disability and work loss. Now we know that, how do we know that? Well, this is one of the um, 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 charts that's produced by the Global Burden of Disease Study, and they produce these every, every few years. This is the latest one that was published in The Lancet. Um, you can see a map of the world. And you can see the colors, in the, uh, the colors across the map of the world. And purple represents the countries in the world in which back pain has uh, the biggest impact. So it's the, in which back pain has, um, is the biggest cause of disability. Now, most of the world there you see is covered in purple. There's only a few countries that are not. In Southern Africa, it's HIV AIDS. Um, in China, it's actually hearing loss. Um, and in Central America, kind of Central America, yeah, um, it's uh, neck pain. So, Back pain is the biggest cause of disability worldwide. And in 2016, that accounted for um, 57.6 million days of, um, uh, sorry, years, years lost disability. And what does that mean? That means that for every person who had back pain and was disabled by that back pain for a few days, or two days, three days, a week, a month, a whole year that was added up by the global burden of disease and estimated to be equivalent to 57, over 57 million days of years lost um, to disability in 2016 alone. So it's an enormous problem, as you can see, worldwide. What does that mean for the individual? Well, uh, we also have some great data on that as well from, um, from Deborah Schofield and her team at the um, University of Sydney. This has done some really beautiful work trying to understand what actually happens to the economic impact of back pain or, um, uh, on individuals. And also the implication of that broader for the rest of, the, for the rest of Australia. Um, and, and, and she focused on the age group of 45 to 64 because that's where back pain is most common. 
And it's also where people begin to think if they have back pain and it's not getting any better, then, then they may take early retirement from work. And in fact, back pain is the number one reason for health-related um, early retirement. So it's the number one reason that people retire early. Um, for those people, um, for people who actually stay in work up until their age 65, um, so they remain in work, Schofield and her team estimated that they accumulate wealth. And the amount of wealth that they accumulate, the median, is $214,000. So by the time you retire, the median amount of uh, the median amount of wealth that you will accumulate is $214. If you have back pain and you retire early, that comes down to three, uh, just over three, three and a half thousand dollars. Now, obviously, that's a substantial difference. Um, so, it's back pain is the leading cause of um, not only the leading cause of health retirement, but it's also the leading cause of income poverty for those who retire early due to a health condition. If we take that a little bit further, we think, okay, what does that cost to the GDP? Well, it reduces income, it also reduces taxation available to the economy, and also uh, increases welfare costs. In 2015, that was estimated to be to a hit to the, to the GDP of $10.5 billion, and in 2013, it's projected to rise to $14.5 billion. Obviously, these are staggering amounts that really could be put to better use. Okay. Now, what do we do about it? So it's a big problem, it's a worldwide problem, has a massive economic and personal impact um, in Australia. What do we do about it? Well, of course there are many clinical trials that have um, investigated different types of treatments for back pain. And it's actually, without doing a systematic review of those, it's quite difficult to get a good number of those, uh, a good sense of how many there are. Lots of people always talk about their, their increase, the, the numbers of trials are increasing. Uh, but I just looked at this this morning. This is the Pedro, is, the, um, is a, um, a search engine um, of clinical trials related to physiotherapy. So physiotherapy, so all types of physiotherapy. But it's interesting, physiotherapists seem to be very organized in Australia. Um, they have some brilliant researchers. Some of the top researchers in the world are in Australia. But um, physiotherapists seem to be doing very well in terms of getting evidence together. And this is a really great initiative, which is um, run by um, a couple of physiotherapies, uh, uh, physiotherapists. Um, so um, you can search this, uh, th this engine. So they log every trial that's um, a, a treatment for any, any type of physiotherapy, and then you can search it. And I did that this morning. And I found 2,000 clinical trials for back pain. And since 2003, when this um, evidence database was established, there have been two th over 2,000 clinical trials in low back pain. There have been also have been over um, 599 systematic reviews that have led to four, 48 clinical practice guidelines. I mean, obviously, those numbers are just crazy. No physiotherapist can keep up to date with, the with that amount of evidence, um, or even in the systematic reviews. It's just uh, um, those are crazy numbers to expect any clinician to be on top of. So, um, so there are practice guidelines, and there's 48 practice guidelines around the world, and there's also an Australian guideline. So the Australian guideline determines or provides guidance on how we should measure, um, assess, or sorry, assess and treat low back pain. So how should we treat low back pain? Well, this was developed in, in, two, in the early 2000s and published in 2003, um, so it's very old. And in fact, it's been rescinded in 2013, so 10 years later. So Australia doesn't have a guideline. Um, on how to manage um, acute musculoskeletal pain here, but this is where the managing acute low back pain guideline was, um, was contained within that. So obviously that's a bit of a problem because there's no guideline in Australia to provide any evidence of what you should do to manage patients that you see with acute low back pain. Uh, there are guidelines around the world, and we did a review of those a few years ago, and actually they all come to very similar conclusions. Similar conclusions, in fact, to the guideline, to the Australian guideline. I should actually say that for the last four or five years, we've been waiting any day for the guide, Australian guideline to be published. I spoke to Michael Nicholas uh, about a year ago, and he said they were almost ready. He's on the panel, um, but we still haven't seen anything. Anyway, we'll come on to the development of guidelines as we go through this a little bit. Um, 
Okay, so we reviewed them, and actually the guidelines are, they really um, um, have some common recommendations. So, and, and, and these common recommendations are consistent, so there's very little around the edges of that. This is just what they suggest, and you're all familiar with this, right? So this is, uh, for acute low back pain, you should reassure a patient that their pr uh, prognosis is favorable, advise them to stay active, prescribe medication of necessary time contingent medication, paracetamol, uh, anti-inflammatory uses a second, um, um, as non-steroidal um, non anti-inflammatories, um, muscle relaxants, or opioids, antidepressants, anti-convulsive uh, anti medication as co-medication, um, as a second line. Um, discourage bed rest and do not advise a, su a supervised exercise program. Well, that do not advise a super supervised exercise program wasn't actually in the, the, the Australian guideline. But anyway, these are all very similar. And, and, and this, this, is the, this is the advice to clinicians. This is how to manage a patient with acute low back pain. Um, so what happens when patients are managed like that? Well, this is a, um, a graph uh, I've taken this from Nick Henschke, and Nick, Nick Henschke's publication in the BMJ in 2008. It's the results of a study that we did. It's a, pro it's a cohort study that we conducted in Western Sydney um, in the mid-2000s. Um, uh, we recruited 275 um, GPs and physiotherapists, and we got them to recruit um, consecutive patients with acute low back pain and then we followed those patients for one year. Now we trained the GPs and the physiotherapists to provide guideline care, which is what you've just seen. Um, so this is what happens to patients when they're provided with guideline care. You can see, I'll just orientate you to the graph a little bit. So this is the probability of being unrecovered um, at uh, when someone, within two weeks of developing back pain. So the probability of being unrecovered is one, that's what you'd expect everybody um, is unrecovered um, at that point. And you can see that in the first couple of weeks, the probability of being recovered drops markedly until it gets to about three months. And then there is a, and then there is a considerable slowdown in the rate of recovery after about three months. And, and that's quite meaningful, I think, so that there's a rapid recovery in the first couple of weeks. People tend to recover rapidly. But if they get to about three months, there's a real change in the, in, in, the, in, in the rate of recovery. I also want to draw your attention to the proportion of people. So this is equivalent, uh, the probability of being unrecovered is equivalent to, being, to having 40% of people unrecovered from back pain at three months. And then in a year, about 30%. So by those, um, still 30% of people unrecovered at a year. And that's a substantial proportion who have been given guideline care. And this guideline care is supposed to be the best available care. So it seems to work for, a bit, be appropriate for a good portion of people, 60%, but for the others, 40, 30 to 40%, it really doesn't seem appropriate at all. So we were interested in whether or not we could improve outcomes for people who were in receipt of um, guideline care. So the first trial that we conducted was in a trial of McKenzie therapy. McKenzie therapy, for those of you who don't know, is a standard physiotherapy treatment which is based on a series of repetitive movements. So the patient who with acute low back pain does a series of repetitive movements and symptoms improve. That's the theory. Um, so we tested whether or not the addition of McKenzie therapy on top of guideline care was, um, was effective, added any benefits to patients, and it turns out that of course it doesn't. Um, so these are, well, it doesn't really matter which one is which because you can't put a pin between them. This is pain intensity, decreases for both groups over the first seven days and up to 21 days. So McKenzie therapy, this type of exercise therapy, has no effect um, over GPK. It doesn't add anything to guideline care. We then um, trialed, um, in a single trial, we had a look at um, the effectiveness of um, diclofenac or spinal manipulative therapy. You know what diclofenac is, it's an NSAID, no, spinal manipulative therapy, you know what that is as well. That's when physiotherapy, the physiotherapists and chiropractors um, push on, um, try to mobilize um, vertebra to try and loosen up stiff vertebra. Um, so that, so we, there was some suggestion that these may provide some help uh, on top of... Um, on top of um, guideline care. So we trialed those and again for NSAIDs on top of guideline care, no effect. Again, no point looking at which treatment is which because they're both exactly the same. And same, same for, um, sorry, the first one was 
NSAID, uh, sorry, SMT, spinal manipulative therapy. The second was NSAID. So no difference between these groups. Okay, so where are we? Well, it looks like we can't improve on guideline care um, by adding any exercise on or any standard type of physiotherapy care like spinal manipulative therapy or even other types of drugs like NSAIDs. Um, what about if we take that back a bit and think about what about the effectiveness of um, paracetamol? Well, the same story. This is, we trialed, uh, sorry, this is by, by um, the group that I was associated with and uh, I left, so not, wasn't, I left being involved on this study. Um, so there was, uh, we trialed par paracetamol in two ways, regular paracetamol, or, uh, so that's time contingent or as needed, um, versus placebo, and we measured patients, 1,650 patients over three months, and you can see absolutely no difference. So paracetamol is not effective either. So simple analgesia, not effective, exercise adds nothing, and spinal manipulative therapy adds nothing. So is that what it is? Those 40% of people cannot who develop chronic back pain um, cannot be stopped from chron developing chronic back pain. There's nothing else that we can add on to that. Well, um, let's just go back to the guidelines. That's, that's what the guidelines say there. So yeah, that's what I've just been saying. So all of these treatments, the treatments that are suggested in the guidelines, apart from these other drugs, which I'm not going to go into today, the rest of those treatments, um, uh, seem to, we can't seem to improve on them. But maybe we can think about this. Reassuring patients and advice to stay active. Um, discouraging bed rest. Maybe we can think about that. What is the purpose of that about for, or, of, of reassuring? And potentially, that is something that maybe we can maximize. So potentially patients are getting better and we can maximize, help those patients who aren't getting better by optimizing the reassurance that we give patients. Okay, well, that's, this is the area that I'm really interested in, is how to optimize uh, reassurance for patients. And reassurance is, what is that? That's a removal of fears and worries. And people come to see you all the time with lots of fears and worries about their back. They're terrified it's not going to stop. They're terrified they're not going to recover. They're worried that they, might not, they may end up in a wheelchair. Uh, they're worried that they may have to go on drugs for the rest of their lives. So they have all these fears. And maybe if we can manage those, maybe we can help patients to, um, to recover. Um, so is that done in general practice? Do you as GPs reassure patients? Do you try to do that? Do you provide those interventions, reassurance and advice to patients with acute low back pain? And this is a study that um, a uh, paper that we published on the, um, by having um, a secondary analysis of data from the BEACH study. Now the BEACH study, I'm sure you're aware, is a study um, which unfortunately has now lost its funding, but it's just the most fantastic data. Um, the, each year, yearly, a random sample of GPs were, um, were taken. A random sample of 1,000 GPs um, were taken. And each were given a booklet with 100 sheets in it. And on that sheet, each GP could write down for the next 100 consul cons consecutive consultations, what was the reason for consultation and what did you do about it? Um, you could have up to four reasons for a consultation and up to three reasons that you could, things that you did. Um, and, and it's absolutely fantastic for people like us, for people like me, because we can have a really good snap, it provides a great snapshot of um, what is how, what GP practice is for a condition like, for example, low back pain. So we had a look at this data, and one of the things, what, what, one of the one of the um, treatments that a patient can get is advice or education or counselling. And only um, eighty percent of GPs said that they did not provide that to a patient. Now, that doesn't mean you didn't talk to the patient, but the GPs didn't provide something to the patient which they considered was an education. Uh, or specific advice, which I think is quite amazing because probably you think you do that all the time, but it's not maybe thought of as an intervention, so therefore it's not optimized. In some follow-up work by my uh, colleagues, um, Chris Williams, um, he um, uh, did some qualitative work with GPs to find out what was the reason for, uh, what do they think about guidelines and how do they think about 
um, implementing guidelines? Do they have any meaning for their lives as clinicians? And they said that the, the themes that emerged was that guideline recommendations didn't really constitute satisfactory care um, for them. They thought it was challenging um, and beyond the scope of a 20-minute consultation to do it really properly, to provide proper advice and education. And they probably required some support in order to engage patients in this type of behavior, this type of intervention. Um, so um, with that, we thought, OK, well, how? If we wanted to really improve this, how would you do this? So what does the literature say on advice and education and reassurance? What does it say? How would you reassure a patient? Well, before I talk about this particular systematic review, I just wonder whether or not um, you, anyone has used a diagnostic test to reassure their patient. Like, exact diagnostic tests like the results of a scan, for example, or a blood test even, if for someone who has acute low back pain. Not using it to, um, to determine whether the patient has a particular condition, but using it in order to reassure a patient. Well, there is quite good research now to say that actually that's a very bad approach to reassure a patient. In fact, that patients who receive tests, in fact, worried patients who receive tests, actually become more worried. One of the reasons for that, we think, is because, um, is because even though they initially feel quite reassured, they feel quite happy, um, as soon as they go out of your office, they think maybe something's being missed. If they're highly anxious, they think something's being missed or something unusual is happening, they're still not recovering, but they didn't find anything on the test, so what's going on? Things are just really, um, and it doesn't help them, um, their, their emotional distress. In fact, it might make them worse. So, but one type of um, intervention might be successful, and that's patient education. So we wanted to know, does patient education reassure patients with acute low back pain? And we conducted this systematic review. And what we found was, and you can see here, I'll just orientate you very quickly. So these are the studies here. And these are the effect sizes produced by the studies and their confidence intervals. And that's the pulled effect. This here, this is the pulled effect. So in the short term, pain, um, patient education did improve, uh, did reassure patients. And in the long term, it reassured patients. So simple patient education was able to reassure patients. It also, it was delivered, you'll like this, it was, delivered, uh, it was delivered by a GP, it had a stronger effect. It was delivered by a physiotherapist or a nurse, it actually had no effect. So really, if you're a GP and you deliver patient, edu uh, patient education to a patient, they believe you and they feel reassured. It's good news. The nice thing about this as well, it leads to reduce hospital um, consultations, future hospital consultations 12 months after um, the, the, the visit. So people are reassured. And that's some nice evidence of them being reassured. OK, so now I'm going to take a stop there, because I'm going to say that up until now, where are we? OK, so we have some guidelines that were produced around the world in the early 90s into the 2000s, early 2000s. And then they all came to a similar conclusion. We should treat patients all in the same way. So a patient comes in, they should all just be given guideline advice. They should be given guideline advice and reassurance. Nothing else improves on that. So, okay, that's it. Just recently, there has been some guidelines which have suggested an alternate approach. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about that alternate approach now. So, the alternate approach is, um, was proposed really by the NICE guideline, which is the UK guideline. This is the publication of it here in the BMJ last year. Since then, the, um, the Belgian guideline has also said very similar things, echoed very similar thoughts to the NICE guideline. Uh, but others, like the American um, College of Physicians, have not. And they've said, no, continue to treat people one size fits all. So treat all patients in the same way. Now, the difference about the NICE guideline is that the NICE guideline is suggesting that we treat patients according to their prognosis rather than according to any assumed diagnostic, um, any diagnosis that they have. So treat them according to their prognosis. So for patients, for example, here it is here. It's a bit complicated, but I'll just show you very quickly. Um, so if a patient comes in with back pain, um, they, um, they should be, they can, 
Well, they say consider, but really they're starting to say that we should use a screening tool, a prognostic screening tool, like the Start Back tool. That's produced by Keel University in the UK. And for patients who score well on that, so they have a good prognosis, they really just get advice on, on, on self-management. For patients who have a moderate or poor outcome, there are other options to think about. Manual therapy, which we know doesn't work. Some group exercise, again, we know doesn't work. Um, some combined physical and psychological problem and psychological therapies. Well, some of these might, might work a little bit. We don't, we, we, we don't know about that. They based this advice on a trial that they did that was published in The Lancet a few years ago, um, which showed that, the, that patients who, were, who received care in this style, so this was, this is um, stratified care, they've called it, um, do better, a little bit. <laughs> when I say do better, a little bit, they randomized people to this type of intervention, so stratified care, versus just everybody treated the same. And there was no differences on pain intensity, but there was a difference on dis the dis disability, and it was a small difference. Uh, but it was cost effective. So this has now gone into the, this is now being pushed through different guidelines. And let's see what happens with the Australian guideline, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if it has something like this. Okay. Um, so the first thing, so, so, so as a group, we were really interested in this approach because it suggests that it gives clinicians something a little bit more meat than just treating everybody in the same way, which we know doesn't work. So maybe if we can identify people who are at a high risk of a poor outcome and we target them with additional therapies, can we prevent them from becoming chronic? The people who are at a low risk of developing chronicity, of developing chronic pain, maybe if we just treat them with standard guideline care, that's enough. Okay, the trick is how do you identify people with acute low back pain who are at high risk of a poor recovery? Um, there are some, as I mentioned, there's the start back tool, um, and we were interested in what other two, if there are any other tools available. And the two really that we came up with, really, when we did a systematic review, the best two uh, were the start back tool and the, uh, well, everyone just shorts, shortens us to the Arebro. So this is the Arebro. You might have heard of it as the yellow flags. The start back is quite new. It's been tested on quite a lot of people. Doesn't do brilliantly though. I mean, this is the this is the pooled area under the curve. The area under the curve is a is a um, is a surrogate measure of accuracy. So you can think about uh, zero is uh, well actually 0.5 is chance, and one is perfect. So it's a bit better than chance. Same for the Arebro. Um, okay. So the tools don't do fantastically for people with acute low back pain. So we decided to try and develop our own, and I'll just talk you through that very, very quickly now. So this is our own study. We developed it on a large sample of um, 1,200 patients, and this is their characteristics here. Um, and we tested it, validated it on another large sample of 1,600 patients. This is their characteristics, and you can see that there are slight differences. That's nice. You really want your validation sample to be different from your development sample. Um, and what did we find? Right, well, so I'm going to compare it to the start back tool because that's what's been suggested by the NICE guidelines. These are the five studies that have provided a effect size plus the confidence intervals um, testing how well the start back predicts people who, who are at high risk of a poor outcome. How well the start back predicts people, people's outcome. This here is the, is the pooled effect, so that's the weighted pooled effect, that's the start, that's the start back tool. The pickup tool does a bit better actually, so we're pretty happy about that. Um, and I just wanted to put this in here as well, just so that you're aware, actually, it, both of them do, very, do much better than clinical judgment. We took this from Mark Hancock's study a few years ago, where Mark asked, patient, asked GPs to, and physiotherapists to predict um, whether the patient who was in front of them would develop chronic pain. And both these tools do much better. So it's probably um, very useful to use these tools, I would say. So what does our tool, which is the winner, of course it's the winner, and otherwise why are I presenting it to you today? What does our tool look like? Okay, so, um, right, so this is it. And we in fact have not just taken, we've taken the tool that we developed and we've turned it into not just a prediction tool, we've turned it into what we think what I would like to think is a clinical tool. I think it's something which is helpful for you and for your patients. 
So this is what it looks like. It's five very simple questions. Right, the first question, how much low back pain have you had during the previous week? Uh, then the next one, do you have any leg pain? Is your back pain compensable? How much you've been bothered, bothered by, feeling, by feeling depressed in the last week? And in your view, how large is the risk that your current pain will become persistent? And these are the response categories you can see here. So patients can just fill those in. This is online. Um, they can fill those in. And that patient with that kind of response, that response pattern would have a predicted probability of 40%. There were 40% predicted probability of developing chronic pain. And we think that's useful information for you as a clinician to have and probably useful information for a patient to have because if you do nothing and you continue just with guideline care, this is the probability that you will develop chronic pain. Now let's decide what we should do about that. Can we target interventions to reduce that probability? Ah, to reduce your risk of developing chronic pain. Um, just very quickly, this is the results that the patient gets. Uh, this is actually the results, not for that one I just showed you, but for someone who had a very good prognosis. So you're at a very low risk. It means you've got a good chance of a full and rapid recovery. Green light to stay active. And gradually reduce, uh, reduce your, return to, your return to usual activities. You can get some other help if you like. Um, and you might not feel it right now, but backs are very strong. We want to get some very positive messages here. Anyway, you can see how that goes. Okay. This is online and it's available for use. Um, okay. So, with our tool, we now think we can identify patients who um, are at a high risk of a media, a moderate and high risk of a poor recovery. What do we do with those patients? Well, as I was saying before, that we, it looks like for most patients, we can, reassure, we can optimize reassurance by educating patients. Well, is there a type of education that we can provide for patients, an optimized type, that might be even better at reassuring patients who are at a high risk of a poor outcome? So this is the trial. So we, um, we were interested in patients with acute low back pain, and these are the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. It's what you'd usually see. And we use the pickup calculator. This is someone who's obviously at a very high risk of a poor outcome. Um, and what about the intervention? Well, the intervention was based on um, the Explain Pain program developed by Laura Mosley and David Butler. And they produced this book in 2002, I think, and it was updated last year, called Explain Pain Supercharged. It's a very interesting book, and basically, it's developed from the work of Patrick Wall, um, and basically, it's an attempt, I believe, to reassure patients by explaining to them the biology of their pain, for, to let them understand, to make them understand why they're in pain, and why it might be a good thing for them to get moving again. So very quickly, this is the, the very broad principles. You hurt yourself, or you, you, uh, there's a threat to some tissue. Those signals are sent up into your brain. Your brain processes those signals and asks the question, how dangerous is what's happened at the periphery? And if there is, a, in this, there is a processing which suggests, brain processes that to suggest that there is a threat, a, a real threat, then you will experience pain. And that's a diagram taken from his book that's supposed to be pain, the orchestra playing pain. Um, so that's very simple. So the brain's role is, how dangerous, is to assess how dangerous is this sensory information that I'm getting from my, from my body how dangerous is it really? And lots of things feed into that. Lots of beliefs, all the situation, memories, contacts, they all feed into that. For example, we know that people who say, I'll live, I will have pain for the rest of my life tend to do a bit worse. Um, there was something seriously wrong in my back. So those, those people who are really fixed on a, bio psych, uh, on, on a biological or biomedical approach tend to do badly. So why? Do they tend to do badly? Well, this is the, this is the approach that uh, Mosley and Butler take, and I think it's worthwhile just going into this just a little bit because I think it's quite interesting and something you might be able to explain to your patients. This is called the Twin Peaks, um, and this just means that if you have back pain, uh, sorry, if you're a person and you are climbing up this mountain, this peak here, you get to a point, you're getting very, very tired, and there's a threat to your tissue that you might damage your tissue. And that's where the threat is. It's right near the top of the mountain. So if you go any further, you will damage your tissue. 
What your brain does is it puts a barrier just before that, and that barrier is when you start to feel pain. So you climb up the hill and you get to this point and you start and you get back pain. And what your brain is saying is take things a bit easier because you're approaching tissue damage here. Your, damage, your tissues might get damaged. Okay, so what happens if you do um, develop back pain and you do damage a little bit of tissue, some tissue? Then your brain lowers the the, the, the threshold for tissue injury because there are some vulnerabilities in the tissue. Uh, but, what, but what the brain does, it becomes very protective of, the t of that tissue. So it puts the, lowers the threshold um, for experiencing um, something to protect yourself, which is pain, back pain, lowers the threat and puts this big buffer in. So this buffer um, stops you from really seriously injuring the tissue. And that's when you experience pain. And I think this is quite a helpful model for patients. I think we have trialed this and the patients seem to really like, seem to understand it. So yeah, that's the safety buffer. Um, so what do you do with that safety buffer, bu uh, um, buffer? Well, over time, for example, if you took this for a six weeks, pro a six weeks program of just um, getting back to your usual activities, um, you can increase the buffer. So if you do a bit of exercise, you can increase, uh, sorry, decrease the buffer um, over time, as you can see there, until eventually the buffer goes back to its normal position, uh, which is nearer tissue damage, um, and then um, you reduce your back pain. So you can do more things without experiencing back pain. And as I said before, what happens in here is that all those beliefs and thoughts and um, uh, memories about um, the situation that you're in, all of those contribute to the size of this buffer. Because you can make it very big if you're very fearful and make it small if you're not so fearful. So that's really what happens over time. So we use that, I think it's very, very interesting, and we decided, okay, well, we're gonna, it takes two hours to explain this uh, over two sessions, and we thought, well, these people are gonna do very badly, high risk of doing very badly. What happens? If we, tr if we intervene and we treat them with this, uh, with this intervention, this reassurance intervention, optimized reassurance. We controlled, the control group was sham education. So those patients were being educated and the control group was sham education. And that was just our physiotherapist, you can see him here, this is the PhD student, Adrian. And he's just talking to the patient, uh, talking to a patient about, uh, letting the patient talk actually is what they're doing. So not giving any advice or any education, just being there with the patient, and this controls for time and for the provision of information. Okay, these are the primary, out these are the outcomes. Primary outcomes, pain intensity on those standard student 10 NRS, and lots of, dis lots of secondary outcomes. Um, we recruited, um, we randomized 202, and we had a 95% follow-up um, at three months. And in fact, over one year, was 90, it was 93%, um, so um, you were very happy with that. It takes a lot of effort, but we were very happy. Um, so what are the results? Okay, pain intensity, well, actually, that's the, um, that's the sham group. Did the, pet, did the active group do any better? Well, no, unfortunately, they didn't do any better. What about disability? Because that's the other important outcome. Um, yeah, that's the sham group. Did the, did, the, um, did the intervention group do any better? Yep, they did do better in the short term. So we were able to reduce people's disability in the short term. So get them better a bit quicker. And then the people in the sham group caught up. So, you can, so, the, so by reassuring people with this intervention, you can get reduce their disability, but not their pain intensity. What about the secondary outcomes? Okay, so no effect with sham for, the, for, the, for those um, secondary outcomes. But some other interesting effects, for example, recurrence, people had in the intervention group had reduced rate of recurrence, um, quite markedly reduced actually, that's about twice, um, two, times, uh, two times less likely to have a recurrence. And they also um, reduced their pains, and, uh, sorry, we also were able to um, reduce, uh, change their, their attitudes, what they thought, and also were able to reassure them as well. So that's the results of that trial, and just to go just to conclude from that. Um, so patient education did not um, influence pain intensity at three months compared to sham, but it might have other effects. We can reduce short-term disability and recurrence, 
and reduce healthcare use and increase reassurance. So we think this is pretty interesting. Um, and I think this is the sort of start is to try to think about what do you do with that group? It's fine to be able to identify a group at a high risk of a poor prognosis, but what do you do with them? And this is one potentially promising thing, and we can play around with actually what we did in the intervention. One potentially, potentially promising um, intervention, but what else do we do? Unfortunately, we just don't have the answer for that yet. So, just to summarize, okay, so that's um, the end of the talk. Um, and I don't think that I've brought any closer to that question, what have they done for us? What have they actually got? Have they improved our lives? Have the guidelines improved our lives? But what we do know is that um, a substantial minority of people with acute low back pain who are receiving gui standard guideline care will develop chronic back pain. And the guideline care cannot, doesn't seem to be able to be improved on with any of the standard approaches that we have. What I think that might be nice if you would consider is to using a prognostic screening tool to identify patients that are at a high risk of a poor outcome and discuss their prognosis with the patient. So use this as a tool to open discussion about what, the pa what kinds of interventions the patient would like to do. I've got, obviously said my back there, that's the tool that we've got, but of course there's other, there's a, there are other tools available as well. And what we also know is that really good quality education, so taking time to educate a patient about their back reduces their disability and reduces the um, rate of recurrence and their future health-seeking uh, health behavior. So we think those are really positive outcomes. Now, we're not there yet, obviously, in trying to um, prevent everybody from developing chronic back pain, but we think that this is a really nice way to start. Um, so thank you very much. Um, to take any questions. Thank you.